just like an AUV, a traditional AUV that navigates by terrain and measuring the seafloor morphology, the mesobot navigates by the amount of light in the water. So it can follow, it's, it's programmed to follow different levels of light. Awesome. Yeah, it's cool. Amazing team, Dana and his team. They they just it was just amazing to to watch them work and be a part of what was going yeah. on there. They they're just so dedicated and put in some very long hours. Yep. But they got that robot in the water every time. And and they have um, it has we we've been collecting Niskin samples, the water samples, so that we can measure. Um, environmental DNA mm. and the mesobot has a system on it for uh, tr triggering similar types of samples although they're not collecting Niskin, s Niskin bottle samples they're filtering water they're pumping water through a filter and then the, they can recover those filters after they recover the vehicle and measure eDNA that way Next so it's kind of a stuff. this is all novel stuff none of this has ever been done right. before uh, <laughs> Apparently, those filters were designed after an Aeropress, or they were inspired by an Aeropress. <laughs> yeah. They're really cool. You just like click in and turn there them. There you go. Filter array. It's two of Dan's favorite things, ROV technology <laughs> and coffee. Yes. <Yeah. laughs> and the two can merge together into a <laughs> eDNA sampler for an autonomous vehicle. Yeah, I was jealous. I've always wanted to make a compensator out of an Aeropress. <laughs> well, I did, but I never actually used it. They're quite uh, some very cool innovative stuff on this spot. Stan, maybe you want to explain what a compensator is to anyone who's listening. <laughs> oh, it's basically uh, oil, uh, oil-filled volume with a spring. Uh, Let's see if I can get this right without mangling it. There's a bellifram inside that's filled with a volume of oil, and there's a spring pushing against a piston on one side of the bellifram that's open to seawater. So it basically creates a, a bias, a positive pressure on the oil volume, and that's affected by the pressure of the, of the sea. As we go deeper, the pressure goes up. So we put uh, somewhere between 5 and 10 PSI in, into our compensators on deck, pushing against that spring. So when we go down to whatever, 1,000 meters, whatever the ambient mm -hmm. pressure is, there's the ambient pressure plus that 5 PSI. And that keeps all of our oily mm -hmm. hoses and uh, mm -hmm. oil-filled J-boxes from collapsing. Keeps the oil in and the seawater out. It's quite the mantra that, you know, we have to get all the air out and make sure they have the proper amount of volume in and pressure before uh, we launch the ROV. They're basically our lifeblood. It'll be interesting to see how the one on uh, Atlanta yeah. hold up. Our um, tilt actuator on Atalanta that tilts the camera up and down has a built-in compensator which uh, was malfunctioning. So we did some modifications and uh, added a separate compensator to it. But this is its first dive. So, so far it's behaved. We haven't had any, uh, any ground faults, which are usually an indicator that the seawater has entered the electronics. So in our comment section, they talked about the Laysan and Albatross. That is actually the Moli, and the Ka'upu is uh, another sort of Albatross. And we've actually been seeing both of those types of birds out here with us. Um, a whole lot more Moli or Laysan and Albatross compared to the Ka'upu. 
do they have, um, is there areas on the islands where they come in yearly to nest, or are they? Yeah, so right? the Laysan albatross belongs to Laysan Island, which is one of the 12 islands that um, that are protected in the Papahanaumokuake Marine National Monument. What's the chances of Argus being fixed in time? Uh, pretty slim while we're, while we're in operations or while we're at sea, it's, uh, it's difficult for us to do maintenance. We have our hands full just turning around the vehicle and, and, uh, any maintenance items we have to do between dives, but also, um, the problem is in one of the one atmosphere bottles, which is, uh, it's not a very good environment to open them at sea, especially if we have any weather. And the okay. third thing is uh, we're waiting on parts. So. And uh, pretty much the only downtime we have at sea in the middle of operations like this is when there's bad weather, which is exactly when we wouldn't want to open that uh, <laughs> that main bottle. So um, I was definitely missing Argus and its two functioning thrusters today in the high current, but uh, it'll be back in action soon, I bet. But not, uh, not Atalanta this did a great job today. I feel there's some beautiful shots of that bird's eye view of Hercules. So. Yeah, thank you. Paul yeah. was struggling the whole time. It was <laughs> about 45 degrees out of his commanded position. So, <laughs> so yeah, normally on Atalanta or Argus, you have two two primary controls. You've got the thrusters, which basically can spin Atalanta or Argus, and um, the winch, which raises and lowers it. Mm -hmm. But then because there's so much weight on it, you don't have any other control. Um, but the current was so strong, pretty much those two controls went down at just the winch. Um, and Dan pretty much had to fly a Herc uh, out in front of Atalanta the whole time without the option to like spin it around and have me keep him in view. Mm. Yeah, that was kind of a switch. It made me work for it tonight, Paul. <laughs> Good challenge. What time are we supposed to check on uh, our deck chief? Usually at 500 meters. I just spoke to him outside. Oh, he's up. All right, great. I have a question, ROV pilots. Um, what is the strongest current you've, you've tried to navigate in, and what does that look like? Tonight it was right up there. Um, Hercules can... Uh, I've only ever gotten it to do 1.8 or 1.9 knots, and I've really tried to get break the 2 knot record with it. <laughs> A couple of the girls that uh, operate the system have broken that record, and it's really annoying that I can't do it. <laughs> so they can also get 20 meters a minute on the way up, and I can't do that either. I don't know. They've got some <laughs> secret they're not sharing. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so tonight we were operating in uh, probably half a knot to three quarters of a knot current, plus moving the ship at a third of a knot, so effectively half of our power was um, being consumed, just trying to hold position. Mm. But I yeah, anything over a knot, and um, what becomes a limiting factor is Hercules can go forward a lot faster, but it can't lateral or go backwards mm. as, as well. So we were kind of limited tonight on the heading, but it, it actually worked out because that heading was looking into the hill so the, so you guys could actually see something back there. But a couple times where I got uh, blown away, blown off position was because they either turned the heading too much and it kind of, you know, it's like a wind hitting your RV camper van or trailer sideways. <laughs> So definitely I two knots would be would be out of our operational envelope. Uh, we do get that uh, when we're uh, 
especially on the surface or coming up. Uh, we've had the equatorial current down here and um, in the Gulf of Mexico we get uh, loop currents. So basically at that point we have to we move the vessel to, to um, get around that. So on recovery we basically have the vessel steaming forward at half a knot. Or on the last expedition we had the vessel moving forward up to two knots at some point just to get Hercules back in the recovery position. Wow. So the speed over ground is two knots, but the the speed through the water is basically you know, zero. Mm. So the the vessels and it becomes a challenge for the uh, vessel if the current is opposing the wind. Mm. So the vessel gets into a position where it's uh, you know, it needs to have its head into the wind for a weather heading, and if the current's coming to the side. It, you know, it, it's challenging for the ship to to hold position, uh, much less maintain a, a bearing and speed. Right. I don't have any numbers, but there was one one time I was piloting on a transect, so we really wanted to hold our course, and we just came over some ridge, and as soon as we did, <laughs> there was this just crazy downward current, and we were still on kind of an upslope and so I was full up on the uh, the vertical propellers and just we were not climbing at all and uh, I think we had to basically give up on the transect back up off the ridge because we just for about like five or ten minutes we just sat there trying to fight the current and couldn't do it. Yeah it's frustrating to get in that position where you can't you just can't go anywhere. Yeah. And if you make the slightest wrong move you go backwards. Great stories, thank you. I was um, I was talking to um, Oriel just recently, and he was talking he was talking about how um, his first shift working DP, um, he felt like a kindergartner, <laughs> <laughs> learning how to trying to figure out how to walk, <laughs> and that was really funny. Um, just to see their the the bridges perspective on you know, kind of starting off as an intern and taking the first steps, yeah. trying to learn how to um, just do the job. Well, uh, if he figures it out, I think he can hopefully teach George, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> George doesn't know how to work the DP. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm going to go. I'm going to have to go and ask him. <laughs> oh, he's listening. <laughs> it's because George is often commenting in our ear about operating the ROVs. <laughs> <laughs> but he's usually right. So yeah. He'll tell us to go east when we should be going. Mm -hmm. And we decide to go west, and it's obviously wrong. He's got an advantage, so he can see out the window. <laughs> yeah, if you've ever tried to use your paddleboard or your kayak or your canoe in the wind. That's a real fun. <laughs> yeah, make the mistake of going downwind and then you have to paddle to get back up upwind to get home. Real quick, do we still have bubble cam in any of these? No, but you can put it back there if you want. Yeah. I might be able to do that, see if I can do it. Yeah. I've got limited. I think it's H12, isn't it? Yeah, H1. but they stole all of our. H12. Yeah, you've got, it. You've got the capability. All right, team, I'm going to check out and go see if I can help out on deck. Ah, uh, yeah, thank you. Yep. They'll be able to use the help. Yep, so thanks, everyone, for a good watch. Thanks, thank you. All right. Thank you. Bubble cam. Thanks. I need to take a wrap out, Paul.
Mm. I'm going to uh, come down below you and take it out on the flight. Do you want me to pause here or keep coming no, up? You can keep coming. How I managed to do that. Maybe we can eat away at Ryan, Ryan and Fiona's brain with some some of their favorite things that you guys saw on this uh -oh. last dive. For me, the highlight was what I already said, that huge bubblegum coral completely covered in basket stars and um, serpent stars. Um, I think that was a really special moment. Um, but just overall, just the density of corals and sponges was pretty amazing. For a while, it seems like it was inescapable, like every square meter was covered in those Acanthagorgia yellow octocorals. Thank you. Fiona, how about you? Um, for me, I think what surprised me the most was just how vibrant everything was down there. I really didn't, ex I really didn't expect that. Um, also, the amount of sea stars we saw, that was also something new. I've usually only seen like one or two, but I feel like down here, it's the sea stars are more diverse. And I'm so glad to, you know, that we picked a few and we get to see them in the lab. Yeah. Yeah, I'm happy with the, the biological samples we got. It's going to be a lot of fun seeing those in the lab. Totally. Um, Kotachi, um, how does it feel? So you guys probably, how long did it take us to map this area? Um, part of the map, most of the mapping was done on a previous mm -hmm. cruise, but um, we, we did a new section that took about like 12 hours, I want to say. Whoa. So after 12 hours of mapping and, you know, all of the mapping that was done last year, how does it feel to finally be able to dive down and really see what's down there? Feels great. <laughs> I think that's the cool part. <laughs> yeah. I'm just going to ask random questions. Yeah, go, go for, for it. it. Okay. Um, ROV pilots, what's your, what is your favorite ROV to drive? Well... I've only uh, driven, you know, Argus, Atalanta, and Hercules, and out of those three, uh, Hercules definitely is the most capable. Uh, Dan has driven, piloted a lot more. Yeah, I'd say the one I'm operating at the moment is my favorite. <laughs> awesome. A Thank more you. pertinent question will be what's your favorite RV to work on? Hmm. <laughs> Tell me more, tell me more. Well, there's, yeah, it's, that would be none of them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I enjoy, um, I enjoy working on, on all of them as well. Mm -hmm. Depends do you on think when we get oh. to work on them. Hey, Dan. Yes, ma'am. Do you think it'll take like a regular schmegular person to pilot Hercules or Argus, or do you need like a few years of training. Uh, the piloting the vehicle is the easy part of this job. So um, most of the ROV pilots I know learned sitting right here in the, in the control chair. The difficult part of the job is um, doing the, uh, uh, the maintenance and repairs to it. So um, basically if we put on if we fail to put on one tie wrap or you know don't make a connection properly or don't put velcro around a cable so that it stays against the camera body yes that's a perfect example so the last dive that we suffered through with um, no camera uh, no working camera on atalanta was a failure on my part to properly secure the fiber optic cable coming out of the back of the camera and we suffered 
with that through the whole dive and uh, ultimately had to replace that cable, which is not a cheap cable. Mm. And it did have a tire up on it, just wasn't. wasn't secured in such a way that it did wiggle itself to death on the way down. Mm. And uh, if I can throw my two cents in about this question as well. So generally these robots are kind of a mix of mechanical engineering and design and concepts. Uh, a lot of electrical components and engineering goes into them. And then of course there's a lot of uh, software and, and other infrastructure behind the scenes to make them all work. So um, typically nobody is an expert in all three, um, but the more kind of hands-on projects and, and kind of experience you have in at least one of those areas really helps then um, becoming an ROV pilot. And like Dan said, a big part of becoming an ROV pilot is also being that ROV technician. Mm -hmm. um, and as many of you probably know, there are internship opportunities that's how i got started four years ago um with nautilus so um, check those out when they do come up when you when you walk into the rov shop it, it, the first time especially you're on the boat if you have any background in, in uh, anything it's all in there hmm. there's there's you know there's a lathe there's a milling machine there's nuts and bolts of every size every dimension standard metric whatever and then over on the other side somebody can be soldering and, you know it, about the only thing they don't have on board is a heli arc welder to, to fix stuff they have that on shore mm. yeah we do have that in the shop yeah what in the rv shop uh no in the shop on the beach yeah san pedro, yeah, san pedro has one i know but so and and you know one minute somebody is is uh, you know wrenching on something the next minute they're playing in the hydraulic system hoping not to blow things up the next minute they're soldering something so it, it's fascinating to watch everybody kind of jump in and tackle a problem you know one minute you're dealing with a with a control circuit for a lens that's not working or a fiber optic cable that's you know not not making the trip so that we either see pictures or have control or something and the next minute you're you know covered in hydraulic fluid it's it's fun to watch those guys it's quite cool. And gals, and and actually, in this case, it's actually. Are you guys outnumbered? Half. No, not yeah. yet. Half. Half, Half of our ROV yeah. team at sea right yeah. now is uh, our awesome women. So. Yeah. It's a pretty cool team. It's um, it's. It it takes uh, it really does. What's the saying about the village? Yeah, it takes a village. Yeah, it takes a village. Yeah, and on top of that, I mean, even if coming out to sea isn't your cup of tea, I mean, we have support engineers on land who, um, you know, do calculations, look at inventory and ordering, help find suppliers and parts. Um, I do. So there's really an incredible, like, range of roles that you can support the technical side of ocean exploration on. Uh. A comment here says, expert tinkering. <laughs> yeah. Totally. Um, <laughs> Dan is the, the king of that. He's always tinkering on some some project, some uh, finding something about the ROVs that could be better and uh, working on it until it is. Sometimes too much. <laughs> Tinker till it's like, oh, <laughs> How am I going to put this back together? <laughs> <laughs> Tinkered two steps too far. <laughs> awesome. Is um, Here's another question. Is field work your favorite part of your profession? What kind of field work have you done outside of AV Nautilus? Sorry, I didn't catch that. I was, I was listening to uh, our navigator there. Yeah. Um, is field work your favorite part of your profession? Uh, what kind of field work have you done outside of the EV Nautilus? Uh, yeah, we all have some varied backgrounds. Uh, my background was uh, I was 
electronics technician and uh, went to work for a company that built uh, manipulators and then later started uh, building the ROVs. And uh, so we did uh, design, build, test, uh, and then later operations. Uh, and then I was a um, service technician for the same company for uh, for a while. So I traveled around and um, did on-site repairs and support and training for the for the vehicles, as well as uh, worked pretty close with the engineering team to do uh, upgrades. So I'd come back from the field with a list of uh, broken things and wish lists from the clients and. Uh, and I got kind of got hooked on the operational aspect of it, and that's how I got here. Thank you, Paul. You want to add in your two cents? Uh, yeah, so I haven't done too, too much field work outside of the Nautilus, but definitely a little bit. and. Um, you know, especially during my PhD, I would always make an effort to, like, if I was making new designs in the lab, um, doing that kind of successive, make a design, prototype it out quickly, and then bring it to, like, the harshest environment that it can handle and figure out what goes wrong and then try again, basically, and repeat that process because uh, you learn so much from doing that real-world real world testing. Um, the other person that might have some interesting answers is Fiona, because I know she's done some field work, uh, doing really cool work as well. Uh, yeah, thanks, Paul. Um, I don't really have a lot of experience with regards to you know deep sea life, but back home, being that I am a core restoration technician and marine monitoring technician, I spend a majority of my week out in the water, um, whether in the lagoon or out on the fore reef. Um, yeah, I would definitely say being out on the field is the best part. Um, so, you know, if you guys want to see some lagoon reefs, come to the CNMI. Shout out to Robbie. He's the best tour guide. Um, yeah. What about you, uh, Ryan? Um, I would say field work is definitely my favorite part of the job. Um, although there are other parts of the job I like a lot as well. Um, I have done some field work off um, the west coast of Vancouver Island, Canada, um, working in the fjords up there, which was really awesome. I've done some work on the east coast, um, looking at coral reefs uh, in the deep sea, along with some submarine canyon environments, looking at the coral and different invertebrate communities there. Um, and yeah, this is my first time aboard the Nautilus, so I'm happy to be here. Jeffrey's done a little field work. I helped him be ready to bring the magic that you all see in front of us. I wouldn't call it field work. It's just a different line of work. I, I've done my fair share of live sporting events and live entertainment events bring all that to this so that we can see pretty pictures under the ocean. Yeah, something we don't talk about too much, but uh, Jeff was instrumental in designing and building this control van we're sitting in, which is basically a mobile uh, broadcasting station. Yeah, the, the, the design concept for this was very similar to what we use when we broadcast a basketball game or a baseball game or a football game a lot of the same technologies, a lot of the same ideas. And uh, it was it was a lot of fun. A couple other guys, Dave Robertson, Nick Nickel, Dan came up and did a lot of mechanical work. And uh, we uh, went to Portland, Oregon and had three blank containers, basically. They had an electrical system and that was it. And we put everything else in. And uh, it was a lot of fun. It was cold, it was windy. <laughs> it was cold. <laughs> And unfortunately, the facility that we were working out of is a hangar, and um, the wind would pick up and just slam the hangar doors and make this god-awful racket. And you know what? They still do. 
Remember the day we shipped them? Oh, yeah. The torrential rain. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Melanie? You do a lot of field work. Very quiet over there. <laughs> I'm trying to avoid the questions towards me. <laughs> um, I love any any sort of work that has to do with the ocean. So let's just call that field work. Um, my field work looks like taking a bunch of kids out on a small canoe and um, teaching them how to sail on our Hawaiian um, double hull sailing canoes. And um, just seeing them be inspired by the ocean brings me lots of joy and um, being able to actually have this experience under my belt and introduce them to this greater world of what the ocean has to offer and um, how there's many paths to the ocean. So like we have, just in this room, we have our ROV pilots, we have the mapping guys, we have um, the film guys over here, and then we have all our ocean biologists and geologists and um, of, of course the people who communicate to the world, so trying to make um, these avenues more available to them, because I feel like a lot of our kids um, feel like these opportunities are just out of reach, and it's, it feels somewhat impossible to get out here, and that's how I felt too, until someone just told me, you just gotta apply, you just gotta put, your, put yourself out there, um, put yourself a little bit uncomfortable place, and that's talking about yourself, in the in your application to to get here uh, a lot of us aren't used to talking about ourselves so i guess it's just trying to teach our kids how to um, really put themselves out there to get their feet in the door out here so that jeff can have a vacation sometime i'm actually the vacation relief for dave so dave gets some time off while i'm out here there you go. Yeah. Awesome. Um, I just like to add into that. Um, I hope this opens up like an opportunity for a lot of um, our people back home because I know that, you know, being such a small island, we don't really get a lot of these opportunities. So, you know, I hope with me being here, this encourages a lot of our younger generations to really push themselves and you know, to also feel uncomfortable in doing situations like this. And you definitely learn a lot and you meet a lot of new great people. Um, yeah, that's it. Maybe you can mention again, Fiona, where you're from? Oh, yeah. Um, so I'm from the Commonwealth. Of I'm from the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands, um, from the island of Saipan, but I'm, per I'm mainly reaching out to all three islands, Saipan, Tinian, and Rhoda, and you know, possibly even Guam. I'm sure a few Guam peeps have been on this trip as well. Yeah. Awesome, thanks. Awesome, we're, I see we're slowly nearing uh, the surface so our conversations might slowly wither away as we give the the airspace to our navigators our rov pilots the bridge and those working on the aft deck to make sure that they they can communicate clearly and uh, make sure that we have a safe transition from the water to the deck and then all the fun begins and we can watch um, the deck team and the wet lab team do all the magic, moving everything from the ROV vehicle to the wet lab. Yep, we are now at uh, 124 meters depth, so getting there. Should we change the bearing? Should we change the bearing just for fun? Yeah. Uh, close enough. Didn't heading. we decide that uh, bearing's not a word, it's heading and track? Very 
track. Change the track. The course, actually, it's the course. Can someone remind me what DP is and why that's important? Yeah, it is the dynamic positioning sh system. So uh, it's basically a jet pump that can control the ship rather than just like running the main propellers. Um, so that lets us really control our position and, and heading or track uh, of the ship precisely. And the jet pump can swivel. So the main, I don't know if the propellers are able to do that, but the jet pump yeah, is on an axis and it can rotate. So you can direct force in a, any direction. Yeah, there's a jet pump directly almost underneath the stern and then there's a tunnel pump up forward. Changing salvo. Between the two of them, theoretically, they can keep the position of the ship. the last the layer anyway, so uh, yeah. very, very steady. I have a quick question um, from our one of our viewers. What is the black and white piece of equipment on the porch? Black and white. Black and white piece of equipment on the porch. Oh, that's the, uh, the scoop that we were talking about. So it's basically a big PVC tube within a mesh bag uh, cinched on there. Thank Some you. really high-tech engineering. <laughs> The one on the right is actually a feed scoop at a local <laughs> farm store, uh, modified with a weight and some holes in it and a lanyard. And some, and some uh, festive decorative tape. Some reinforcement under the tape so the manipulator doesn't crush it. Thank you. It's like the squid is the squirrel of the ocean because it sounds the same and every time someone sees it, they're like, squirrel in the comment section. Sort it out on the So I will come to full stop at five zero pretty soon. Yep. Ahead. Can I stop there, Paul? Winch is at fifty meters. Yeah, understood. Five zero. Are we okay to recover? Roger. You're clear to recover. Good, good to come up. Bridge, main deck, are we okay to recover? Main deck, bridge, yeah, bridge is go for recovery. So it's coming up. So, uh, <clears throat> you can disable your thrusters and uh, be ready to turn off all your lights. Yeah. You can probably turn them off except for your, you can turn your app light off. Oh. Or now leave you, sorry. Yeah, you can leave them on for now. I'll just pull them up, turn them off as we're pulling it up. Yeah, he likes you to turn it off before you pull it out of the water. It'll blind him. Got it. You can turn your tail light off now if you want. I think that's that one, right? Yep. Thanks.
50 count. Oh, and the first 3D prints. So I'm keeping an eye now on the HPU temp and the volume. As well as position and ready to pin it hard. But I mean you need to run them, right? Like not really. I could be dead stick right now, it wouldn't mm. make a difference. Just have to come up a little slower on the winch. But yeah, watching the heading, make sure those are opposing, matching that, and the visual on the half cams. Mm -hmm. Looks like we're going to get a goal, Paul. Looks good in Rob Nav. We can see the hue. See the hue coming. Mm. Bridge, this is Control. Control bridge. Please reduce thrust to 25%. Reduce jet pump. 25%. Am I uh, clear to turn off the lights? Yep. So now I'm uh, auto heading full, full ahead mm -hmm. and I'm keeping an eye on that wire cam as well as uh, yeah I'm just I'm just the aft tag line now. But basically I'm pulling on it as hard as I can to. as soon as it hits the deck I'll ease off a bit so it's still in the air there so I'm still pulling on it now it's on the deck so I can slack off a little so now I don't want to pull on it because I'll try and pull it back off the deck again yeah yeah you can hold position Rich, this is control Bridge. Please hold position. Position, thank you. Yeah, Bridge, you can slow down this plus. We don't need this much on this. Okay, copy that. In theory. Oh, he's got a good, I think he's got a good uh, bit of current on the bow there. Or a bit of wind.
So now <clears throat> I'm keeping it tight, but not too tight. So if I see Argus or Atlanta jerking around on the deck, then I'm, and the waves will come and make the tether slap up. Mm. But if I'm too loose, then they have a, you know, it's hard to get the daisy chain off. Oh, got it. And it, and it, the other day it was like all oh, slack. Oh, yeah, and yeah. The, and the recovery line gets wrapped around the tether. So I could probably go into bypass and do it now, but it's, it's not getting hot. ambient temperature there is on the surface now it's a lot cooler 17 on the last expedition we had like 26 on the surface mm. 